Welcome to the Expert Edge. This is the show where we bring on experts in their fields of health and wellness practice to hear their stories and learn what they see working in the field of diabetes reversal and prevention. And I'm really happy to introduce today's expert, Mary Welch. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. We're so glad to have you as well. For those of you that have not met Mary, she's a dedicated mother, wife, and double board certified oncology nurse practitioner. She's also a no BS certified weight loss coach, community educator, and passionate advocate of eating and thinking smarter. She is convinced that a healthy life is within everyone's reach. And she promotes the idea that the fastest way to transform your health is by changing what's on your fork. She's lost 80 pounds herself and seen the stark consequences of lifestyle diseases like diabetes, cancer, and dementia. So she founded Weight Loss to Wellness. Her mission is to empower individuals to embark on their health journey. And she really likes working with cancer survivors on their path to better health through personalized one-on-one -on -one and group coaching. So Mary, I would love to hear the story about how did you actually get interested in this area of health and lifestyle? Well, I have always wanted to be a healthy fit person and I struggled with yo-yo dieting from my teen years. I remember being on diets in high school and having to lose weight to qualify for a scholarship for the army ROTC and really sitting in the sauna to sweat out weight. So I weighed in at a certain weight. So I, I felt like I got into this gimmicky quick weight loss yo-yo pattern early on and I could lose weight but then gain it back. And it was very mm -hmm. frustrating. So I had weight swings of 50 plus pounds multiple wow. times over my life, trying what Oprah did in the eighties with, um, you know, a liquid diet, 420 calories, you lose a lot of weight, but then you don't change your patterns and go back to eating the pizza and the hot dogs, whatever unhealthy stuff and the weight would come back. And yeah. so I had done multiple things and I had lost weight in 2014 and, um, it impacted my kidneys a little bit. And then I had slowly gained weight back. And then I really was stuck at an all time high of about 238 pounds for me, BMI of 37, which was like a class two obesity. So as a healthcare professional and a nurse practitioner, I felt like a hypocrite. Here I was mm -hmm. telling people to be healthy and I couldn't even button the lab coat around my hips. And um, I didn't feel good, but I was stuck there for two years and really thought about embracing my oversized body and not trying and buying clothes that fit and just embrace the body that I'm in. And I'm like, okay, maybe that's just what I'll do. Cause I've tried so many times and failed and maybe I'm just meant to be a big girl and I'll just look beautiful and be confident in the skin I'm in. So I was almost there and I went to a continuing professional development conference where the speaker was talking about obesity and cancer. So I'm sitting in the audience and I'm like, I wonder what this lady Anne Katz has to say. So I'm sitting there and she's like, well, obesity is responsible for about 30% of cancer development. It's linked to at least 13 different cancers. And the population I take care of is the gynecologic oncology mm -hmm. population. So women with the cervical cancer, ovarian, uterine cancer. And specifically with uterine cancer, at my weight, my risk was quadruple the risk and then wow. increasing up to seven times the normal risk with BMIs of 50 to 60, so severely mm -hmm. obese people. And I thought, wow. And then the next thing she said was that it was a modifiable risk factor. And I'm like, wait a minute. It's a modifiable risk factor. I know about this. She's speaking my language. I never smoked because I knew that smoking was increasing cancer. And I never thought of my weight as impacting my health, which is silly, right? I mean, here I am, a nurse, nurse practitioner for 30 plus years, but the light came on. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't know what I was going to do. But I thought at the time I was, I was scared. I had just turned 50 and I hadn't lost weight. I had my child late in life. So I have an eight-year-old at home or nine. And I thought, I want to live. I see what my patients go through with 
treatment. And even with the best surgery and chemotherapy and radiation, many of these ladies die from their uterine cancer. I'm like, am mm-hmm. I can prevent this by changing the food that I eat and making better choices? I absolutely owe it to myself and my family to try one more time <laughs> and go for it. So that's when I left there and um, I ended up, you know, sometimes the stars align. So I had backstory before this meeting, which was in September, I had a patient that was supposed to do chemotherapy. I had gone through the teaching and everything and she was scheduled and then she didn't show up. And I thought, I wonder what she did. So she went to some alternative treatment center and I Googled that place and when I was on that website, a banner ad popped up and it said permanent weight loss solution, nurse practitioner, free challenge, sign up here. So I had put my name and email address in there and forgot about it. Well, after this meeting where I'm like, I need to do something the very next day, it's like challenges starting on Monday. I'm like, what challenge is this? So I sometimes think divine intervention comes into play. So I'm like, Mm -hmm. okay, I am going on this challenge. And it was pretty easy. It was like, okay, day one, drink water. Day two, um, you know, pl- plan, find a recipe that, you know, includes whole foods and get the ingredients and make it. Another one was move your body. And I think another one was looking for hidden sugar and things that like things you wouldn't think like salad dressing or um, <laughs> you think you have a healthy salad, then you pour a bunch of sugar on it. And then I think the last one was what was difficult for you and hop on a call. So I ended up getting on a call with this gal and hired her and worked with her for um, about eight months one-on-one. And I never had tried coaching before, but she really kept me accountable, kept me from doing this all or nothing, but really incremental changes that were sustainable over time. And it changed my life. Um, And at that time, I started really getting curious. I found um, Jason Fung, who I loved. He's written a bunch of great books. I the first book I found was the obesity code. Mm -hmm. But then I'm like, Oh, he has a book called the diabetes code and the cancer code. And they're all kind of related. So so interesting. Before before we go farther, I just want to back up before we kind of lost a train of thought we started. And that was that he what really made a difference for you was as a nurse practitioner working with cancer patients, you saw the link between being overweight and cancer development. And I think that's really key because so many people that are dealing with diabetes are also dealing with obesity. And we know that diabetes increases your cancer risk. So I just want to make sure people are seeing that connection clearly. What you're bringing here is noticing that what you were dealing with, what you were experiencing was actually increasing your chances for cancer. And especially some of the female cancers that you were specialized in. And so that kind of like woke you up. And I think a lot of people have something that happens as a wake up call. So as you, yeah, and that makes a difference. And then the second point that you're bringing out is that you started working with a coach and that that provided an environment where you were able to figure out how to learn habits that supported your health better and had that accountability and support. Now, it occurs to me that when you work with a coach, it's not for free, generally speaking. So would you say in your estimation, was it worth the investment and why? Yes. And I had no idea what coaching cost. And yeah, I never worked with the coach. And honestly, when I got off the call, I was a little shocked because six month investment was $5,000. And I was like, wow, $5,000. But again, another thing that aligns, my mom had just passed away and I had received a little bit of an inheritance and what was left was about $5,000. And I thought my mom always wanted me to be healthy. And I thought that was like mothering from beyond. And I thought, okay, my mom's with me on this journey and I have to do it. And I you know, kind of felt a little sick to my stomach, but that was in 2018. And what are we in? 2024. So six years and it's led to permanent weight loss. And mm. um, so, you know, is it worth it? Is it a lot of money? Yes. But 
being sick is a lot of money. And when patients go through cancer, they're missing work. Often a month of treatment is $10,000 for some of these drugs. Mm -hmm. And so we invest in things that are important. So would I, did I, I mean, honestly, it was extra money that I didn't have. So luckily, you know, I had it and it was a great use. But I think even if I didn't have it, if I know now what that investment was, I would do whatever I could to find the resources to fight for my health. Because like you said, I got curious after that, I started looking at all the new patients coming in with newly diagnosed uterine cancer and just looking at their weight because it never dawned on me, but I'm like, hmm. BMI 42, BMI Mm. 48. I'm like, these, most of these people had a BMI over 30. I wasn't seeing people in the 25 to 28 range. And so I Mm. really thought it's a thing. It is. And it is something, it may not be easy to lose, but if you just lose a half a pound at a time and keep at it, Mm. you'll get there. It's, it, I think that's a really interesting point you bring up as well. And that is when we think about making a change, it can seem very overwhelming. Like, well, this is the only way I really know to do this is the only way I live. And if I really want to change, what are ways that I, that I can think about that change that will support me in that change? Like, you, you know, we've talked and you mentioned phraseology, like, what do I want? versus what am I willing to do? What What's the difference there? Yeah, I, I think for a long time, I want it to be thin. I want it to fit in my clothes. I want it to just mm, have a normal BMI. But then it is what I'm willing to do matching what I want. And it's like, well, am I willing to pack a healthy lunch or am I willing to say no to the free donuts someone brought in to work am I willing to forego the candy because I didn't plan for it you know and it's I think sometimes it's like in the moment it's like oh it's there and it's good but is it really good and keeping what you want front of mind and not feeling like you're missing out because you're creating the health you want. And it's like, I got to the point where I'm like, I know what that donut tastes like. And it's not even that good. It's kind of greasy. And I have a delicious apple that's going to really be much sweeter once you get off the processed degree stuff. And having something there that keeps you from being unprepared. So I, I think that was a huge piece too. I'm willing to pack my lunch and have healthy food that is caring for the person I want to be Mm -hmm. versus this person that's wanting to be thin, but not even bringing lunch. And now I'm hungry and I'm eating whatever's inside. And it's like, Oh, there's pizza or there's a donut or there's candy. And now I'm eating because I have no plan. So am I willing to plan? So what do I wish for versus what am I actually doing about it? Like making that difference in your mind. So not just having like a pipe dream, but actually what am I willing to do to move forward towards that step by step, little by little. And you also talked about consistency and habit stacking. Tell us a little bit about that. How does that play into make actually changing what we're doing? Right. So I love the image. If you've ever seen a ladder against a wall where there's one with a lot of rungs and it would be easy to climb up and then another one with a few rungs really spaced apart and you can't quite reach the next rung. And if you are going from a really standard American diet with a lot of processed food and junk, quickly shifting from that to this super clean diet may be such a far reach that it's not Mm -hmm. sustainable. So I think being okay and with the mindset that you're creating a lifestyle that you can live in forever. Mm -hmm. So I always think in my mind before a diet ended and then I could go back to whatever. And it's like, no, if you go back to that, you're going to get the same results because clearly (laughs) as a yo-yo dieter, I have proven this over and over. So I'm like, Mm -hmm. what am I willing to do today? And it may only be 
a 1% or 2% level up, but it's like, okay, I'm bringing my lunch. I'm going to eat fruit instead of a donut. I'm Mm -hmm. going to um, make sure I have protein with every meal and just little things. So it doesn't have to be this all or nothing. It's like, what's better than what I've been doing? It's like, if I've been going through a drive-thru getting the extra value meal, can I go through a drive-thru and get the kids meal? Can I go through and not get French fries? Can I get a hamburger? You know, if that's what you eat wrapped in lettuce instead of with a bun, what Mm -hmm. can I do? That's a little bit of improvement. So and I eating think, ice cream out of the carton, can I put it in a bowl or a smaller bowl? Or maybe I don't have ice cream in the house and I'm just getting a cone with one scoop when I'm out and it's a planned treat instead of a binge, so to speak. Yes. And I think that, you know, thinking stepwise, like what's the small doable change that I can do? And I know I could do it long term and piece by piece, those can actually build into significant lifestyle changes with long-term positive results. And so I, I appreciate you bringing that up because sometimes people get discouraged. They're like, I, I can't make this big change or this is just too hard, but we can break it down into steps and steps that we each find manageable. And that can be different for different people. Um, I remember running a lifestyle change program. and I had one lady when, as soon as she learned about the refined and processed foods and what they did to her health, she went home and she literally took everything out of her cupboards, read all the labels and threw away everything that had refined or processed foods in it. And she did that like overnight. Other people may not be quite willing to jump in with both feet like that and may want to do it over even a month or two months or something like that. But as we, you know, as we go ahead. No, I was just saying I have a lady I saw for treatment yesterday. And one of our doctors tells people when they're starting treatment, avoid white food. Just in general, he saw white sugar and potatoes and rice and pasta and really anything starchy. And she saw, well, I've been, I think even dairy falls into there. So she was avoiding all these things for about three months, two months. And she thought, I feel so much better. I'm down 15 pounds and she's on chemotherapy, but she's all, I'm feeling so much better because all of that stuff causes some inflammation. So Mm. so I didn't know that I was eating so much sugar and things like bread and pasta. And um, and so I can't believe I feel better on chemo than I did with the food I was eating before. And she wasn't really heavily overweight, but it was interesting that that came up in conversation. I said, well, what have you been doing? So I've been eating just like avoiding the white stuff, like Dr. Whatever said, I said, well, that's that's so, so mostly you eat protein and vegetables. I simply yeah. eat healthy, nourishing food for your body. Isn't that something? Yeah. And it's interesting how this is so tied to inflammation. And why, what do you, when you share with your patients, why do you tell them inflammation is such an important thing to get control of if we really want optimal health? What is the role of inflammation in our body? Inflammation is a good thing when you have an acute problem. So let's say you have a splinter in your finger and it gets red. That's your immune system fighting that temporary thing and it should go away in a couple of days. But unfortunately, a lot of us are in a chronically inflamed state and that can lead to major problems where you have gut health issues, you have heart disease issues, um, leading to things like dementia or even diabetes. Before I lost weight, my kidney function wasn't perfect. And when I started reflecting back on my labs, I'm like, what is it? And it was really my inflammatory diet that Mm -hmm. was impacting my kidneys. And, you know, my A1C was up a little. So I knew if I didn't change, there were signs that my kidneys were not going to be great. I would evolve into diabetes. So with Mm -hmm. the changes I made, my kidney function went back to normal. My A1C came down and really getting control of inflammation helps with so many things like arthritis and um, heart disease and the lining of the blood vessels. And, Mm -hmm. you know, cancer is a big deal and for women, but really heart disease is the bigger killer of women than cancer. And I think cancer sometimes gets, you know, breast cancer gets, Oh, one in eight women get breast cancer, but something like one in three get heart disease. And um, Mm. so if you can decrease inflammation and, improve your 
vascular tone, that's going to give you longevity. And mm -hmm. really what you eat creates your body for the future. Uh, our building materials are the fruits we eat. So when that really helped me visualize what I'm eating. Do I want to mm -hmm. be made out of a piece of processed food that's not good for me at all, like a donut? Or would I rather be building my cells from mm -hmm. really nourishing foods like um, a beautiful carrot or just an mm -hmm. eggplant or some gorgeous greens and mushrooms and things that just have nutrients that are not modified and that can just right. give you that fuel to make really good quality cells instead of these things that lead to inflammation and the oils and foods a lot of the mm -hmm. processed foods have seed oils that are very inflammatory so that was one thing I learned because growing up I you know my mom didn't really know she would serve us margarine and it, all these processed things that are so bad for you and you know going back to just the natural things right things like right. avocado oil olive oil healthy fats like an avocado mm -hmm. you can put that on toast or yes <laughs> it's such a great tasty substitute for like butter or margarine and it has so much fiber and all these phytonutrients that help us to fight cancer as well and really decrease inflammation in our bodies and i think that paying attention to um, not taking in the foods that create or increase inflammation in our bodies is a very key idea. And it, it's so interesting to me that some of the most anti-inflammatory foods are our fruits and our vegetables, right? Or our high fiber foods like legumes. So really loading our plates with lots of that kind of food is going to have a huge impact on the inflammation that our body is dealing with. And as we decrease that, I think people start feeling so much better and often have like less pain and, you know, all of these things that we often don't, we kind of take for granted as if they were normal. I mean, I have people telling me all the time, it's like, yeah, I have my aches and pains, but I guess that's normal at my age. Well, no. <laughs> and you don't not. know till you make a change. Honestly, before I got on my health journey, I had pain in my ankles and my knees. And I kind of was like, okay, well, I'm 50. Maybe this is how it's going to be. Well, mm -hmm. number one, losing weight takes a load off the joints, but also getting rid of that inflammatory food, the, the pain went away. And when I've tried this with friends and family, I've seen the improvement in just a week or two where they're like, mm -hmm. I couldn't do the stairs or I have to do them one at a time because my knees hurt. And mm -hmm. with the little cleaning up of the diet and pulling out some inflammatory foods within the fault, they're like, I realized I was going down the stairs normally and it didn't hurt. I said, isn't it funny how our bodies can heal when we pay a little attention and mm -hmm. give it some loving care? Mm -hmm. I just so true. So true. And as we talk about inflammation, something that some people are thinking about maybe intermittent fasting. In your experience, has that also had an impact? Absolutely. And for a couple of reasons, I think number one, if you are, so intermittent fasting, basically you have a timed eating window and you can mm -hmm. have it as much or as little as you like. But a lot of people find a eight hour eating window works really well with a 16 mm -hmm. hour fast. Generally, if we're not snacking at night, you may have a natural fast overnight. So when you stop dinner till you break fast or break your fast with breakfast. So many people naturally have a 12 hour fast. But you know, if you're a person that snacks in front of the TV and you're eating through the 9, 10, 11 o'clock shows with usually it's not broccoli, you know, it's usually <laughs> things like cookies or popcorn or something that's mm -hmm. just sugar and that not only does closing your eating window after you have your evening meal, it gives you time to digest your food. It improves sleep quality because mm -hmm. if you go to bed after you've eaten your body is spending energy digesting food and digesting food is a huge energy suck from your body. So rather than mm -hmm. doing the restorative repair work that your body should be doing while you're sleeping, it's digesting dinner. It's not 
filtering out your brain and doing other things that usually happens at night. So yeah. just, yeah, I think that's then a great idea. And I also, I, I like what you said about an eating window of eight hours and a fast of about 16. I really feel like that longer fast, like more than 12 hours really does help your body with healing, with your immune system. And then sometimes I've had people ask me, well, you know, should I skip breakfast and just eat lunch and dinner? And, and even though that is technically, it can be an eight, 16 fast. In my experience, I found that if people eat breakfast, especially if they're dealing with blood sugar issues, having a good breakfast, a hearty lunch early in the afternoon, and then closing their eating window actually can work extremely well for blood sugar control, quality of sleep, and all of those sorts of things you brought out. So I, I think that's a really great tool that can be so helpful to people in weight loss. I, I was seeing some research where without changing caloric intake, simply seeing that you took all your calories in before three o'clock in the afternoon created weight loss. So just the timing of our meals can make a difference with weight loss, even without a huge change in what we're eating. So it's like, mm -hmm. I hope that those of you that are listening are taking away some of these tools and you pick one of these tools to start implementing. So I really want and you, you to- know, One of the things that, oh, go ahead. Yeah, one of my prior diets, it was these little containers and it was really talking about fueling your metabolism and eating every two to three hours throughout the day, which to me was exhausting. But when you understand the science, and I think that's what Dr. Jason mm -hmm. Fung's book taught me, was that when you are fasting and without food, your insulin levels are low. And when mm -hmm. insulin levels are low, you're able to tap into stored body fat for energy mm -hmm. because insulin's a storage hormone. So if your insulin levels are up, you can't really burn stored fat because you're in storage mode. So keeping yeah. that insulin level down overnight, you can tap into then the stored fat for energy and not have the ups and downs of sugar. And I do think if you have breakfast in an eight hour window, it's easier to hit your protein goals for the day. I, I find mm -hmm. if you're only eating two meals a day, sometimes it's a challenge to eat enough protein to maintain muscle mass as we, um, you know, get older and want to not lose muscle. As we can, right. So. We don't, that can be an important piece. And I think, you know, all of these things that we've talked about today are things that will help us lose weight, help us decrease inflammation, help us decrease insulin resistance. So all of that's really important when blood sugar is an issue for us. And I would love for you to just take a minute to share with our audience what is this free gift that you're offering for us? And we'll have the link in the description for this video right below the video, but tell them if they click on that link, what will they get? Yeah, so it's a quick start guide to decrease inflammation easily. And it's really a reminder of some easy things that you can incorporate right away to lower inflammation and pick a couple and just start doing them. and. Notice if you have less pain, if you feel better, if you have more energy, um, I'm sure you will. And it's, there's a little quiz or assessment on there too, that you can just check off and see where you're at. And, um, you know, change every choice you make is a chance for better health and, um, just choosing to do something that leads you in that direction of health can change your health and your life. And, make you feel so much better. So That's so true. And I just want to say thank you so much, Mary, for taking time out of your busy day to be with us today and to share some of these encouraging and inspirational experiences that you've had and things that you've also experienced with your patients. And I just want to thank all of you that are here today for being here with us, because remember that health is wealth and it comes by choice, not by chance. Have a wonderful day.